Who remembers, as a kid, how much she loved to draw? Anybody remember? Well, I never stopped loving it. I've always loved to draw, and it's just been a part of my life. I remember, oh, here we go. I remember, as a child, growing, growing up in the suburb of Seattle, my friend Brittany and me loading up her little red wagon with drawings we'd made and peddling them door to door in her neighborhood. Our main goal was to make enough money to buy a couple candy bars. And I remember that entrepreneurial glow of pride when we succeeded. But I never thought, as a grown-up, I'd be able to make it as a full-time artist or illustrator. Or I'd be living with my parents for the rest of my life. So when I went to university, I studied Russian, thinking I might be a journalist or a translator. So I went to Russia. And I studied for a year and worked for a year. And while I was there, I just was absolutely blown away by the artwork I saw in the museums there. Amazing things I'd never seen in the West or heard of. There was these huge folklore-inspired canvases by artists like, such as Viktor Vasnetsov. But I was also very taken with some of the um, more pared-back artwork by some of the revolutionary and avant-garde artists. People who um, would just maybe use one or two colors. Here you can see some early examples by Olga Rozanova and Natalia Goncharova. And it may have been just that they didn't have a lot of extra money to spend on paint, but working within their color limitations, it made their work all the more bold and striking. And I was really inspired by this. So when I moved to London, I started trying to work within my own limitations. I started going to evening classes, and after they'd finished, I'd meet up with, with classmates and we'd set our own projects for ourselves. And I started to make little photocopied books. And then I started to sell them at comics fairs, where I could get a table for as little as five pounds if I'd share it with somebody. And at the age of 30, I did go to art college and did a part-time two-year course studying illustration. And also, I set up a blog where I would try to post a picture every single day that I'd drawn, whether I thought it was good or bad, just as a discipline for myself. So here. Um, yeah, so here you can see some of the work that I've done. I did actually become a professional artist, and it's been a lot of fun. Some of these are books that I've written and drawn myself, and other ones that I've worked on with other people. So that's me, but I'm curious about you. Raise your hand if you like to draw. Raise your hand if you think you can't draw at all. Quite a few. Oh. Raise your hand if you never draw, because you'd be embarrassed if people saw the results. Oh, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> when I visit schools and talk to kids, very often they assume I was some sort of child prodigy, some genius at drawing. And I like to tell them a little secret. Here you can see my sister and me drawing, when I, my sister Mary. Um, this is the secret I tell the kids. When I was a kid, I wasn't actually that good at drawing. I was OK, but nothing special. But as the other kids started growing up and stopped drawing, I just kept going because I loved it. So people often, they sort of look at great works of art, and they think, oh my goodness, I could never do that. But often, it's not the big technically perfect drawings that we really connect with. It's not, say, the pictures that we might share on social media, because they make us laugh. I get very inspired by children's drawings, because they constantly show me that a good drawing is not necessarily about photorealism. For example, look at this drawing of a horse. It's fine. People say horses are hard to draw. There's nothing wrong with this drawing of a horse. Let's look at another drawing of a horse. This drawing, it's a bit silly, isn't it? It doesn't even look that much like a horse. But I actually prefer this drawing. I think it's got more balance, it's got more energy. It makes me smile. Let's add a bit of color. Yeah, I'll take this horse any day. So for me, what I've learned is that getting good at drawing is not about perfection. It isn't. For me, it's about connection. So what do I mean by connection? Two things. First, there's a basic connection with the paper itself. And the second one is a connection with other people. So let's start with the paper itself. I often meet people 
who have great ambitions to create an epic graphic novel, maybe 200 pages or more. They're hiding away with it. It's daunting. Maybe their drawing style's even changed since they started making it, like, years and years ago. And they're feeling frustrated. Very often, these epic projects never happen. Sometimes, the best thing we can do is to give up the big plan. We can take small steps. We can do little projects. Giving up, doing, doing things on a smaller scale isn't giving up doing what we love. Say you love books and you want to make one. You don't have to prove your commitment to books by starting with that epic novel. I like to tell kids that all you need to make a book is a single sheet of paper. So here you go. This is not a book. But if you fold it in half, it's a book. It's got a front cover, a back cover, and room inside for pictures and words. How do you publish a book, you might ask? Well, you take it to the scanner, the photocopier, you put it down, you run off, say, 20 copies, you fold them, and you've got a nice little edition of books that you can share with friends, give as gifts. Here are some examples of some books I made while I've been learning how to draw, and many of them aren't more than a few photocopied pages long. So if you make, say, two of these books a month, you get, we get so much more experience doing this than we do if we just contemplate that epic novel for 20 years but never actually do anything. So there's a second secret I tell kids, and it's this one. Draw bad books. Make really bad books. And their teachers often kind of look at me a bit funny. But you're never going to get the good books unless you do the bad ones. So say your first book, you make it, and it is terrible. I mean, really, really terrible. And the second book's pretty terrible, too. Next book's kind of bad. Third book's a little better. Next one, maybe even a little bit good. And you're never going to get to that great, great book unless you make all the bad ones. So accept we are going to make bad books. Revel in it. Maybe even make a book that's spectacularly bad, just to prove it, just to see what happens, because you can. And that's the thing, is keeping a sense of humor about our work but also a sense of forgiveness. What do I mean by that? Well, I made a comic, and it features rabbits, but you might be able to relate to it anyway. So here's a little rabbit, drawing his picture, looks at it, goes, ah, stupid note, drawing, no good, I should quit forever, scrunches it in a ball, throws it in the bin, plunk. Can anyone relate to that? I can. Imagine now that you did that to your child. Say your kids doing the math homework. They're struggling a little bit. They hit a hard spot. They ask for help. So you're going to come up and you're going to go, Ah, oh, you're so stupid. I can't believe you're any child of mine. Get out of my house and never come back. Throw them down the street and slam the door behind them. Would you do that to your kid? No, of course not. That's bad parenting. <laughs> What you'd probably do is you'd come up and you'd sort of give them a bit of help. Then you'd, if they have a meltdown, you'd give them a hug just to show that it's okay. You know, they're having problems, but you're there with them. You're going to stick with them. You love them. You know, it's, it's all right. And sometimes we need to do that with our drawings. We need to look at them and say, hello, little drawing. You're not very good, I know, but you're good enough for now. And don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. You're safe with me. Maybe give it a little hug inside you, deep inside you. And I'm not saying to be childish about your work, even if you're making work that's aimed at children. What I'm saying is it takes a lot of maturity to realize there's something deep in you that's vulnerable and growing. And it needs looked after, just like you would a child. So that's very important. So connection. I'm actually connecting with the paper. I'm giving it a hug. But what about connecting with other people? There's that connection thing. Sometimes we need to send our drawings to playgroup. We need to let them run around, fall over, meet other kids, ex you know, grow, explore. If you draw a picture and it's not perfect, but 
It makes somebody else smile. That's a really good feeling. Or if you come up with a joke together and you both have a laugh, that's such a boost. So I run a, a, a studio group online. It's a virtual studio on Twitter called Studio Tea Break. And a lot of people gather there to do drawings who might just be feeling a little bit isolated. And the drawings that we post are very simple. Here's one called Shape Challenge. And I just put up a shape and people turn it into something. So this one I've turned into a robot. There's another one on Thursdays called Portrait Challenge. And we redraw or reinterpret an old masterpiece. And there's lots of people in our group. We have everyone from an eight-year-old to professional artists to grown-ups who just love to draw but are just looking for an idea of what to draw. And the idea isn't to create a perfect work of art. It's to, it's to try things out, new styles, see how other people tackle things, just kind of have fun. Because often for me, it's the goofball drawing where I'm not trying too hard or I'm being a bit silly. And I'll suddenly think, oh my goodness, I just discovered a whole new way of drawing. <laughs> and I'm hoping you might be able to relate to that, whatever field you're in. The benefit of sharing ideas of being able to find a space with other people where it's OK to be vulnerable and to try things out, where things very well might go wrong, and it's OK. So it's all about connection, not perfection. We're here at this conference because we all want to connect. So we can listen to motivational talks all day. But until we actually do some of these things, we never learn. So you're very welcome to join us at Studio Tea Break on Twitter. But let's get started sooner than that. Let's do a drawing right now. <laughs> Grab your pens and papers, and I'm going to teach you how to draw a monkey. In fact, it's a sea monkey from my book with Philip Reeve, Oliver and the Sea Wigs. Let's see. Yep. OK. And if you're watching this online, I mean you too, grab a pencil and paper and come draw with us. <laughs> OK, everyone got a pen? Hold up your pens. Yep. OK. First thing you do to draw a sea monkey is to do a head. So a very big head, just like that. OK. Now we're going to draw the nose. And it's a bit like the letter M, but it's got three bumps, so it goes Boom, boom, boom. And you can make the sound if you want. Sometimes that helps. Boom, boom, boom. OK, now we're going to do the muzzle. And you just take a line here, go down there, line here, and go down there. Now we're going to do a big staring eye. So sea monkeys are very silly, quite mad creatures. And if yours looks a bit wobbly, that's even better because they are kind of that way. Right, we're going to make the other eye even bigger, just to make it look a bit stranger. So make a really, really big eye. It might even go off the side a bit. Now you can decide. Is your sea monkey looking up, down, left, right, cross-eyed, wall-eyed? You decide and draw two circles for pupils. So I'm going to make mine cross-eyed. And do two circles. And color them in quite dark. There we go. Now he's looking at you. OK, next thing we're going to do is the ears. And they're a little bit like the letter C. So there we go. Big ear on that side. And then a backwards C on the other side. Now you just do another little C inside for the inner ear. Now you get to, we get to make them a mouth. And it could be, it could be like just a little smile, or it could be a line all the way across, or it could be roaring with massive teeth, or it could just be going, oh, which I think I'll do. Oh, a little circle. Maybe put some teeth in there. Just. Now I have a really cool way of drawing bodies that just kind of you don't have to worry about necks and shoulders and all these things. You just draw an upside down U. So like that. 
No, it's very easy. And then do another sort of shallower U inside that. And you have a body. That was really easy. OK, now we're going to draw the feet. And they're a bit like little skis. It's a ski monkey. So there we go. Two little lines like that. And then you stick two more little lines on them, like chicken feet. So like that, 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 that. And at Oliver and the Seabugs, they're, they're sea monkeys. They're aquatic. So we're going to give them web toes, web feet. So web, put some webbing between their toes. Now, we're going to draw the arms. And they're really easy. They just go shooting off his body like that. No complicated elbows or anything. You don't need them. People often say hands are hard to draw. But if you have a clenched fist, you don't actually see any of the fingers. So make little clenched fists. All these little tricks. OK, and now he needs a tail, or she he needs a tail. So it could go any direction. I'm going to have mine kind of curling down here. And then just make a little bit thicker line or just do a second line alongside it to make it a bit thicker. Now, sea monkeys are pretty scruffy creatures, so we're going to give them a lot of hair. Yeah. Give them some hair. As scruffy as you can. You can spend hours doing the hair, or you could just do it really fast. On the head, too. And they're, they're so gross and disgusting. They kind of cry, crawl out of seaweed. So we're going to have some fleas coming off, at least one flea coming off. Fleas are really easy to draw. You just go dash, 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 dot. There you go. That's a flea. And there you have it. That is a sea monkey. So hold up your drawings. And let's see these, these creatures you've made. Let's see this army of sea monkeys. Oh my gosh, these are amazing. Brilliant. Hooray! So those of you who said you couldn't draw, you can. You can draw a sea monkey. <laughs> so it's all about breaking things down into simple shapes. And learning how to draw, it's about setting yourself small, achievable tasks, like learning how to draw one cartoon monkey. So if you enjoyed this, you can keep going. You can maybe one cartoon animal at a time. So the reason we've drawn it is because we're all in a room. So we've connected. It's all about connection, not perfection. So I hope this has inspired you. And watching you draw has inspired me right back. Thank you very much. <laughs>